It says, but understand this, that in the last days, dangerous times of great stress and trouble will come. Difficult days that will be hard to bear. Anybody feel like that scripture has been written for you in some part, part of 2019? Difficult days that will be hard to bear for people will be lovers of self, narcissistic. Y'all heard of the selfies? Narcissistic, self-focused, lovers of money, impaled by greed, boastful, arrogant, revelers, disobedient to parents. I don't know if y'all have ever experienced any of that. Yeah. Ungrateful, unholy, and profane. And they will be unloving, devoid of natural human affection, calloused, and inhumane. They'll be irreconcilable, malicious gossips, devoid of self-control, intemperate, immoral. This is getting pretty bad, isn't it? Brutal, haters of good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of sensual pleasure rather than lovers of God. And then in verse 5, this is our key scripture for today. It talks about these people, and in kind of a summary, it tells us that they will be holding to an outward godliness or religion, although they have denied its power. For their conduct nullifies their claim of faith. And then the scripture admonishes us to avoid such people and keep far away from them. Now, hopefully, none of us fall into the category of, of being haters of good and brutal and re irreconcilable, malicious gossip, so on and so forth. But, but what if, just for the sake of argument and a good sermon point, what if that last part might apply to some of us today? What if that last part that says, that says in, in the last days, which I'm going to go ahead and say that we're in the last days, Holding to an outward form of godliness or religion, although denying the power thereof. We serve a God who has true power. I mean, think about it. He created the universe out of nothing. There was void and he spoke through the very power and sound of his voice. From nothing came something. That's a powerful God. And that's not a fairy tale, you guys. That is a true actual occurrence. If you, if you have the belief, as I do, in the Scripture, and that it is literal, and that it is the inspired, God-breathed Word. It's an account of creation. That's a powerful God. Let me tell you what, what power is not. Power is not religion. Oh, I, I mean, sure, there's power in religion. It's a good way to control the masses, as any malicious government will tell you. It's usually pretty good good about controlling people. When you place religion and restrictions upon upon people, that that has some power. But I'm talking about I'm talking about creative power. I'm talking about a supernatural, amazing, miracle working, life transforming power. I don't want to be one of those people that have to be avoided because I have a form of godliness but deny the power of God. Sometimes we even try other sources of power. We, we may get into some things like uh, chemicals or substances, drugs, alcohol, uh, even prescription drugs. And, and those can provide some, some power, some energy sometimes, but, but they'll ultimately cost you your health and cost you, cost you big time in the long run. Some, uh, we, we may have uh, sometimes gotten involved in, in other supernatural power. Do you know that any supernatural power that comes from anywhere other than the Lord God Jehovah is 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 of the devil. And some people are perfectly okay with that. Of course I'm not. So so there's there's witchcraft and you know some people want to ask like Dorothy did, are you a good witch or a bad witch? Um, a witch is a witch someone someone who has supernatural power that doesn't come from God above. That's sorcery, witchcraft. The Bible condemns it. So that's a source of power, and there is some legitimate power there. It's not all fairy tale, unfortunately. There's some there's some real power in in the, the forces of darkness. But they'll leave you high and dry. They will cost you your cost you your soul ultimately, and and will not lead you to the path that you need to be on to inherit eternal life. And then, of course, there's the uh, 
the oh so popular narcissistic kind of power, the power of you, the power of you, the power of motivational thought. And I love motivational thought. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm all about a good seminar. I'll go and watch, and I even I even like the preachers who are all about pumping you up and, and empowering you. Those that's encouraging stuff. But we have to remember that the, our source of power is is from God above. That's that's where the power comes from. I love to be encouraged, and from time to time, I think I even I even preach some encouraging sermons. But guess what? It ain't about me, and it ain't about you. You can think all the positive thoughts and and have all the the self help books in your library, having read them all. But ultimately, the power that you're going to need to impact the kingdom and to get your ministry in your life where you need it to be and where God wants it to be does not come from you. It's going to come from, from God above. Now, I'm going to tell you the first, the first uh, source of power, the first jewel um, of power today. And uh, you're going to probably think, oh, that's what this is going to be about. I mean, we know that. We remember that from Sunday school. That was... I don't want to hear about that again, but let me present it to you this way. That that source of power is, is faith. And maybe the reason that that doesn't seem very interesting is because because we hear about faith all the time. I mean, you got to have faith, 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 right? Faith is just a common kind of everyday word. I have faith that it'll happen. I, I think it'll happen. I hope that it'll happen. Maybe it'll happen. Yeah, I've got faith, I guess. Or sometimes we even ask, what faith are you? You ever hear anybody ask that instead of what church do you go to or are you a Christian or what are you? It's what faith are you? Oh, well, I'm Baptist or I'm Presbyterian or I'm, I'm Pentecostal. You know, that's, that's your faith. Y'all, that's, that is not, that's not faith. Those are some, some somewhat related words that faith has begun to be used for. But faith, the scripture tells us, is you could probably quote it like I can, that the what? Substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Not some sort of whimsical, intangible kind of thing. It, it, it's a literal power. Faith, uh, faith is is a force to be reckoned with when accurately applied. Faith, it, it's, and may the force be with you, by the way. The, the faith force is something that is literal and tangible. The, the faith, Jesus said, if it's even the size of a mustard seed, can move mountains. And you know what he was actually referring to? I believe it was, was a literal mountain. Now, I don't need a, an actual mountain moved. I mean, like a literal mountain moved. Although sometimes um, I've, I've started doing the, um, the track, the trail out in the woods at Bonita. And sometimes I get to what I think is the end. And then all of a sudden there is a hill. And I, I, I could just declare that someone has been adding extra hills to that. And, and maybe that's the time when I could just be like, mountain, get out of my way. But other than that, I don't need any literal... Ma- no, you get almost to the end and you're like, okay, I know that this is the end. All of a sudden, there's a hill that wasn't there yesterday. <laughs> it's the craziest thing. Anyway, but how about the the, um, the the not-so-literal mountains in your life? Because if it can move a, uh, a real mountain, then don't you believe it can move another mountain? One of those psychological mountains or those those physical body kind of mountains, the mountain of, of, of pain in your body, the mountain of brokenness in your leg, arm. Don't you know that the faith is something that is, that is real? It's not just an idea. It's, it is a verb. You know, um, in school they teach you a verb. I mean, not a verb, but a noun. Uh, (laughs) You know, not what I said, but something else. Um, It, a person, place, thing, or idea, right? Well, well, faith is not an idea. You, some people might want to put it in, in that category, but it is a thing. It is a literal substance. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean that it's not there. Just as we can't see the wind, but we can definitely see the effects of the wind, right? That's how faith is. If you're born again today, if you're a born again, blood-bought, child of the Most High God, you didn't get there without having actual, literal faith. Not just the idea of faith, but you can't be saved. You can't be born again without actual faith. So it's a real thing. And if and if you are a child of God and you've used faith to become born again, you become the 
the possessor of something that's incredible, eternal life. Do you know how much power it requires to go on living forever? They keep searching for perpetual energy. It's right in the word of God. It's the force that all Christians have within us. To each of us has been given a measure of faith, in fact. But you know what? I'm not even talking about that little measure of faith that comes just in the, just with knowing God. I'm talking about the faith that goes beyond that. I'm talking about you and me going out of this building today and being faith-filled people. People that are powered up. See, I told you it wasn't going to be the regular conversation about faith. People who are powered up to make a difference. People who take authority over the things that they encounter. When we, go, when we see someone who is sick, when we see someone, encounter someone who is not physically, spiritually, mentally, like we know God has designed them to be, let's go ahead and take care of that. We pattern ourselves after Jesus, correct? Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. The scripture tells us that we have the ability to do even greater things than they did, which is hard to imagine because, I mean, he was Jesus, God concarne, Jesus in the flesh, God in the flesh. But that's what the scripture tells us. Even greater things we will do than they did. So y'all, again, I'm not talking about just an idea or an ideal. I'm talking about right now we can begin to have the kind of faith that can literally move literal mountains, can literally raise sick people from their deathbed into health. You can believe it. You cannot believe it. If you've got faith, go ahead and apply your faith to my conversation about faith. If you don't, go ahead and ask God to give you the faith to have the faith to believe that you can have more faith. It's a power that we need. We don't get very far without it. Do you realize that? The advances that we haven't made this year, much of it has been because of a lack of faith. Faith is different from wishing. The kind of faith that I'm referring to is, is the faith that God has supplies for us y'all we need it we need it we need it are you hearing me we need this faith how do you get the faith how do you get it it's like yeah well we agree brother randall yes we need faith we've been needing faith for the last 80 years we know this so tell us how to get it well it's easy it's right there in the scripture faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word so right now if you have been listening this morning your faith level should be greater right now than it was when you walked in because faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word and we're not referring to the word of cnn or fox news we're talking about the word of god so if you want to build your faith go ahead and get into the word now we can read the bible we can we can we can read scripture after scripture and chapter after chapter but we need to be reading faith building chapters to build our faith don't we? we need to be building this chapter. How about starting with God's promises? Let's see how much this builds your faith. God, whom I believe, and I hope you believe, the creator of the universe, so you know he knows his stuff. God has plans, the scripture says, to bless you and prosper you and not to harm you. Now, if that doesn't get you excited, I don't know, that's unfortunate, but it should get you excited the very creator of the universe, the one who can who can make statements like that and, and, and go ahead and have them ratified by becoming flesh, dying on the cross, raising from the dead, and giving us eternal life, that kind of God, he went ahead and made that statement. He has plans to prosper you, to bless you, and not to harm you. I'm glad that the one with that kind of power doesn't have plans to harm me. Does that build your faith at all? That's a promise that's in the Bible. That's straight from the Word of God. So when I say that faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes from the Word, you're going to need to get in the Word to build your faith. One Now, number two is the power of the anointing. That's a little bit less common. If you come to church all the time, and you, you may have heard about the anointing, you may have an understanding of the anointing, but, but in addition to faith, that's, that's our number two, is the power of the anointing. The anointing is... It's not always what it's perceived to be, but the anointing is empowerment. 
the anointing makes your natural abilities multiplied. When I play piano, for example, when I can tell when I'm just playing because of my skill and, and, um, and practice, and I can tell when, when the anointing takes over, and I begin to play at times beyond my actual skill and understanding. The power of the anointing. The anointing makes singers sing better. It makes musicians play better. It makes preachers preach better. I don't want to operate in any ministry form without the power of the anointing. Now, you know, in the Bible, there are various kinds of anointing. Ultimately, let's think of it like this. To anoint means to set aside for a specific purpose. Now, we talked about faith, and just with being born again, you're given a measure of faith, although, again, we need to grow that faith into a, a whole other level of faith. But the anointing does not necessarily come just because you're born again. The anointing that we need to operate in is a whole different thing. The anointing that I'm talking about is, is transferable. It's, it's increasable. And once again, it's even tangible. Tangible in that it has a supernatural basis, but has actual physical world results. How many of you remember a while back I preached about Obedidim, where the Ark of the Covenant you know, it stayed at his farm for a while. The, the anointing of God was on the Ark of the Covenant so powerfully that Obedidim's farm began to be blessed and prospered. Not because he was working harder, not because he discovered some divine secret, but because the anointing of God was there on his farm. So, of course, maybe you know the story, but, but, King David and, and the people went back to, uh, to take the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. We won't go into the entire story, but, but they went to take it back to, back home. And God had warned them because of his incredible presence, his incredible anointing on the Ark that they couldn't touch it. They had to take wooden rods and put through the, through the slats on the side and carry it that way. But, but they hit a bump in the road. And as you may have guessed, some help, helping, uh, person, helpful person decided, oh, let me steady the ark, and he touched it, and he fell over dead. I didn't say it was a happy story. You see, his capacity was not powerful enough to remain living after coming, in with that, after coming into contact with that level of anointing, that direct contact. See, physical world results from something that is supernatural. Now, we don't necessarily get to have the level of anointing that was on the Ark of the Covenant, because once again, we know what happened to the guy who was trying to be a healthy helper, right? But we do need that kind, maybe not that level, but that kind of anointing on us. There's, there's a time when the presence and the power of God was so powerful in the temple that the priest could not even go in. I would be okay with that. When the presence and the power of God becomes so mighty in this building that we have to stay in the parking lot and have church, and we can just sit on the outskirts, kind of like Obadidam's farm, and just be blessed and prospered and grow r right out there. That'll be okay. That'll be okay. We can learn from the example of the guy who tried to, tried to steady it and fell over dead. We can... We can learn that we shouldn't try to handle an anointing that wasn't designed for us unless we want to be crushed. You see, anointing, once again, is, is used to set you apart for a specific purpose. I can't operate in your purpose for what you were anointed for because I'm not anointed to do it. Your purpose will crush me. You can't operate in my purpose. My purpose will crush you if you're not anointed to do what I do. Are you following me? So what we can gather from that is that we need to identify what our purposes are. What has God called you to do? This isn't scriptural, but, but I think it's a very wise saying. 
God doesn't call the anointed, but he anoints the called. The Great Commission is for every single one of us. If you're a child of God, the, the duty to spread the gospel is for you. So you are called. What is your calling? So how do we get to that how do we get to that point where where we can increase the anointing in our lives? Where we can increase that power? Well, we can get some biblical examples that could give us some insight. Um, remember the um, the prophet Elisha, powerful prophet, powerful man of God, anointing on him like crazy. His predecessor had a lot of anointing, Elijah. Elisha asked for a double portion. So I would say that probably the first key would be to ask. We're good at asking, right? We don't mind asking for things. If we apply our faith, we can even get what we ask for. See how that ties in together with the first point? I would ask, hey, here's how, here's how awesome the anointing was on Elisha. Elisha, when he finally died, after doing many, many miracles, they put him in a sepulcher or a, a grave. And like a year later, his bones were still there. And they had been invaded um, by some enemy armies. They saw one of the, uh, the groups of raiders coming at them from a distance. And they had a corpse of someone else who had just, who had just passed away. And they didn't want the corpse to be defiled or you know anything out of the way to happen. So they said, let's get rid of this body real quick-like. And the quickest way that they found was to just throw it into the grave where the bones of Elisha were. But when the body came into contact with the bones of the anointed man of God, the body didn't stay dead. And Elisha performed his last miracle. The body stood up and came back to life. That's the power of the anointing. You see, it's, it's somewhat different from, from, from faith because you know how, how much faith the bones of Elijah had? None. But the anointing was still there. The anointing was still there, powerful enough to raise the dead. And believe it or not, <laughs> it's going to need to probably be on the believe it side of it. Um, but we can have that kind of power too. We don't even have to wait till we're dead. The dead can still be raised. The lame can still walk. The blind see and the deaf hear. Even today, but we need to ask for it. Kings are anointed, biblically, to be kings. Remember David, Jesse's sons, all, what was it, seven of them stood before the prophet Samuel after God had told him to go to Jesse's house and anoint a king, and, and each one passed except the last. No one thought to call him. Surely he would never wear a crown. But when others see a shepherd boy... God may see a king. I love that song. And sure enough, they went and got the little shepherd boy, the youngest, brought him to the house, and suddenly the oil that had not flowed for any of the other seven began to flow, and they anointed little David. Well, little David was anointed to be king. That was what the anointing was for. And this is the anointing, the setting apartness of God on David's life. That was his calling. So David was able to kill a bear, able to kill a lion with his bare hands. Tell me that's not a performing beyond your natural gifting and abilities. David was a musician already, but you know, after the anointing was there, he played and he played for the king, even uh, the current king, his, uh, his predecessor, Saul, and uh, demons fled from Saul when David would play his harp. Y'all, I want that kind of anointing. When I play piano, I want the demons to flee. I want to see demon-possessed people to start falling out in worship service. Yeah, that, that'll be all right. Yeah, because, you know, they just... 
real world stuff. This isn't sci-fi. I'm serious. This is this is stuff that we need to happen. This is stuff that I want to see happen right here in this in this church. Demons fled from Saul, and then of course you know the story. He went on to the battlefield. Didn't even wear the oversized armor that that King Saul tried to get him to wear. He picked up all the just what five six stones. What does the scripture say? Five stones. How many did he need? Just one. One stone, one shot, hit the giant Goliath and killed him when no one else even dared stand up to him. Just a little boy. Don't you know David wasn't just like, you know, I can really play that harp. I think I have a chance to kill this giant. That was the anointing of God. I've heard people say, you know, David had to practice his skill. David had to practice practice with that slingshot. He had to he had to work on it. It didn't just come. Well, that's partially true because you know God expects us to do our part. But but that kind of skill, one shot, one stone, right between the eyes, sunk into his forehead, killed him dead. Now oh, that's the anointing of God. That slingshot skill was greatly increased. It was multiplied because of the anointing. Here's another reason we need the anointing of God. I'm talking about that powerful, real anointing of God. Remember Moses' um, family members that got kind of jealous, been out of shape? Miriam and Aaron, his brother. They sinned and spoke against Moses. Now Aaron had been anointed. He was anointed as priest per God's instruction. So Aaron carried on him the mantle of the anointing, and he had the the actual the mantle of um, you know all the the garb that they had to wear to to uh, be in that position as well. But the oil had flowed; it had been poured on Aaron. He was set apart and called to that position, and he operated in it. It didn't make him perfect, though. Let's keep that in mind. You can be anointed and just be out of God's will. So that's a whole separate thing you got to work on there. Life is not without its challenges, right? But Aaron and Miriam got bent out of shape and they spoke against Moses, which was God's big chosen guy. You know, we're talking the guy who led them out of Egypt. God became very angry and came down and manifested in a powerful way. Well, Miriam, just being Miriam, She got blessed with leprous skin. Some say she got leprosy, and you could put it that way, but she... The anger of God caused her to have skin that was that was leprous, which was a terrible condition. And people reading that think, well, wasn't Aaron there too? Didn't he do the same thing? He did, but... You know what didn't happen to Aaron? He didn't get leprosy. What was the difference in Miriam and Aaron? Aaron was anointed. Do you know this morning that you need to be anointed because of the protection that it places on you, your life, and your household? You need to be anointed. I'm not talking just born again, just saved. That'll get you to heaven, but why not go under the full anointing of God. I mean, that's pretty powerful when the anointing of God will protect you even from the wrath of God. Well, that's deep, right? Well, a little bit later, it came Aaron's time to have the, the mantle stripped off of him. God told Moses, take him up on the mountain, remove, remove it. So Moses went up, stripped off Aaron's, all his garb and the anointing was removed, and then you know what happened to Aaron? Well, the anointing was got was gone, and Aaron died. It's good to have the anointing, and it's even better to keep the anointing. So I ask, how do we get that anointing? How do we get to that level? How do we get that power up situation? Well, Again, number one, I would say is, is ask, according to what I read in the scripture. Ask for it. Have you asked? Well, I'd pray it pretty much every week, especially if I'm preaching. God, please anoint me. Inspire me and anoint me. I don't want to operate outside of the anointing. I wouldn't enjoy it, neither would you. God probably wouldn't even be a fan. 
want to operate only in the anointing of God. But but beyond that, if we use to think of the examples, you know, Aaron wasn't asking to be made a priest, and David wasn't asking to be made a king. He just wanted his sheep to be okay, pretty much. The second biggest thing is be be available. In Acts seven fifty five, Stephen looked up, and being filled with the Holy Spirit, he saw Jesus standing next to the Father. The fullness of the Holy Spirit in our lives is is what we need. It can open our eyes to places that are beyond normal perception. The gifts of the Spirit are an incredible reason to be filled, fully filled with the Holy Spirit. All the spiritual gifts, y'all, we need those in the church working in their full capacity. Discernment, tongues, interpretation, prophecy, faith, wisdom, knowledge, healing, and miracles. Sometimes we stop at tongues. Now, that's not the only gift. We pray for healing, and maybe we receive it, maybe we don't. Those aren't the only two gifts. There are a lot of gifts, and God wants us to enjoy and have every single one of those. The power of the Holy Spirit can take us beyond a limited experience with God. Now, the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 2, was poured out and became available to us in its fullness. The same fire that fell on them is available to fall on us right here this morning. And some of us us have experienced that fire falling on us. Some of us have experienced that. But I don't want it to just be a one-time thing. I don't want it to be a just every few years thing or every once in a while thing. I, I, I want a daily refilling of the Holy Spirit. Not that the Holy Spirit has left me, but I want to be re-engaged each day with the power of the Holy Spirit. Y'all, it takes life and ministry. It takes it out of you. Every time you pray for someone, every time, every time you tell someone about the gospel, that's taking something out of you. Much as Jesus felt the virtue leave him when the, when the woman touched the hem of his garment, it's taking something out of you. Sometimes just life. The amount of time that you have to wait at a stop sign. Right? It takes a little out of you, doesn't it? So let's power up daily. Power up every day and get a refreshing and a refilling. The, the Holy Spirit, now, the Holy Spirit existed before Acts chapter 2. Even in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was around. But the, in the Old, the Old Testament, the, the Holy Spirit was more, was more with them. I mean, Samson, and he wasn't even living, right? You know, he, he, the Holy Spirit came upon him and he did powerful things, right? Um, even before Acts chapter 2, uh, Elizabeth, uh, John the Baptist leapt in her womb and she was filled w- with the, you know what I'm talking about, even before Acts chapter 2. But, but the, but these were not the kind of, the kind of potentially permanent indwellings and baptism with the Holy Spirit that they experienced in Acts chapter 2 when the promise Remember those promises? When the promise of the Father came, that's the kind of dispensation that we get to have today. The fullness, the overflowing, the permanent residence of the Holy Spirit being on the seat of our heart. And that's what we need. We need faith, and we need the anointing, and we need the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't stop just because you... Look, I'm not going to. I'm not even going to argue with you about whether you receive the Holy Spirit at the same time that you're born again or whether you don't. Here's the point. You need to receive the Holy Spirit. If you got it when you got saved, praise God. If you, if you think you got it at a different time, good. Just have it. Just make sure you got it until you got it. Okay? I'm not even going to argue about whether or not you have to speak in tongues. I have my belief based on Scripture, and you maybe have a different belief that you think is based on Scripture. That's You know what? I'm not even going to argue that. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. As we used to say, get the Holy Ghost. I got the Holy Ghost. And we need it. Will you all stand with me, please?